Doctor, I have not seen my home for 18 years. I want to go back. Well, ask the Khan again. I intend to. But this time, I shall offer him a gift so magnificent that he will not be able to refuse me. You mean to give the doctor's caravan to him? Yes. <laughs> In the summer of 1963, whilst the first season of Doctor Who was in pre-production, the newly appointed Head of Drama at the BBC, Sidney Newman, suggested to the programme story editor David Whittaker that an old colleague of his, John Lucarotti, should be considered as a potential writer for the series. On Tuesday the 9th of July, Lucarotti was contracted to write a seven-part story provisionally entitled Doctor Who and a Journey to Cathay. Having previously written a 15-part CBC Canadian radio series about the travels of Marco Polo in 1956, Lucarotti was well versed about the details of Venice's most famous explorer. On the 15th of July, Aiton Whittaker, the drama group administrator, circulated a memo confirming the details about the first three stories that would make up the new series. A Journey to Cathay was scheduled as the third story to go into production following Anthony Coburn's second script, The Robots, a story which would ultimately get pushed further and further down the schedule until it would finally be abandoned during the spring of 1964. In his memo, Whittaker also requested clarification as to which studio was going to be used to record the series, as Lime Grove, the usual venue, was due to undergo some alterations. I understand that Studio D will probably be going out of commission for conversion in December. I would be glad to know as soon as possible which will be the replacement studio for Doctor Who as it will clearly have a bearing on the facilities available for Journey to Cathay. Three days later, Whittaker had drawn up a proposed schedule detailing the planned filming and recording dates for the series up to the end of 1963. At this point, it was proposed that five days filming at Ealing would be completed for the new story from Monday the 9th of December, with the first episode being recorded, possibly in Riverside Studio One, on Friday the 27th of December. The problem over studios was resolved on the 23rd of July, when Terence Cook, the acting drama organiser, responded to Ayrton Whittaker's memo. There seems to be a misapprehension as to when Studio D comes out of commission for conversion. It is not, in fact, until 1965. I have investigated the situation with programme planning, and there is apparently no alternative studio that can be offered. This means we must carry on in Studio D, and it is obviously vital that you should know, in case this limitation makes Journey to Cathay an impossibility. Luca Rotti began writing A Journey to Cathay in July 1963, but as he revealed in the chapter he wrote for Peter Haining's 1986 book, The Doctor Who File, he found the whole process somewhat difficult. David asked for detailed storylines before I wrote the actual scripts, but back in Mallorca I found that by the 4th I was bogged down. I didn't know my characters, not even the Doctor. I needed to write scenes to discover them. I spent four hours in the local village post office trying to telephone David at the Beeb to explain my hang-up. When, finally, I spoke to him on an appalling line, he simply said, Do it your way! Which is what I did. The director assigned to the story was Indian-born Waris Hussain, who began work casting for the series during the latter part of 1963. Uh, I think uh, Warris Hussein saw me at, I did a play for the, uh, the RSC called A Penny for a Song, which was, uh, which was a period piece, as an uh, 18th century uh, play by uh, John Whiting. 
and he saw that. He'd been working in the theater, and I think this was his first television. I'm not sure about that, but I think, this, you know, and, and he'd seen me in that. And he asked me to go and see him uh, and said, would I like to play it? So I said, yeah, you know, I mean, you don't turn down work. I mean, it was OK, playing Marco Polo, nice romantic part, nice romantic lead, you know. Uh, they, he told me they were going to spend a lot of money on it and uh, they were going to, you know, spend much more money on it than they had before. Uh, I, I, I knew Darren, uh, Darren Nesbitt, quite well because he was a contemporary of mine. I'd worked with Bill Hartnell on a film called... Um, uh, Heavens Above with Peter Sellers. Good news, Jeffrey. The eviction order's just been served on. Just look at the place. They've turned it into a damn garbage dump. Now, what about the uh, council's planning committee, Father? Oh, they're all fixed, Jeffrey. Should go through all right. Do you want our legal boys to draw up the uh, building contract? Well, if you wouldn't mind, Sir Jeffrey, just at the moment, I prefer to have a gentleman's agreement. Seeing I'm under council myself, you know, I, I think it would look better. That's the way you want it. In the meantime, we'll uh, go through the motions of putting the job out to tender. Thank you, Sir Geoffrey, very much. Well, my only worry was his eviction order. These local boys can be a bit sticky when it comes to splitting our families. <laughs> Nonsense. This building's going to put a lot of money into a lot of pockets around here. Nobody's going to worry his head about that Scruffy Smith family. Um, I went to a, a, a stage school, and I will um, conveniently forget this girl's name, because I'm sure she won't be, want to be remembered for this, but... Um, um, she, she was a very pushy young girl who I was in a class with and she went up to some ball um, at the Grosvenor House, I think. It was some television ball. And it's funny because I matched the story with Waris later on and it did kind of match up. And she came in to me and she sort of said, oh, she said, I, you know, she's all a bit huffy. She said, I shouldn't really tell you this, but I've, I've, I spoke to somebody yesterday and um, they're looking for a sort of Chinese-type person um, for the BBC, and I said, "What?" She said, well, she, "She said I'd said about you. I told them about you. I told him about you." He said, uh, "So she gave me the number." And I remember sort of thinking, "This is a bit odd." And, and I actually tossed a coin, heads tails, heads I phone, tails I don't. I didn't know. I thought this is, sounds so weird. So it came up, whatever it was, and I rang and I said, hello, you know, my name is Enema. You don't know me, but my friend told me, you know, I mean, it was really corny. My friend told me to, to ring you, and he said, well, yes, OK. Uh, when can I? And I actually was, at the time, rehearsing for Toad of Toad Hall. I was a, a, a rat and a ferret and a field mouse or something, something wonderful. And, and I remember they all, again, teased me. They said, you're going to see... Because it was a Saturday, and I literally went to see Waris after a Saturday rehearsal. I think we finished at one, and I said, you know, he told me to come round to his house. Go round to his house. Oh, 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 you know what that means. I mean, I all, you know, I got teased like mad. And so I went round to Waris's flat. It was in Fulham. Um, and and he, you know, he was very sweet. He was a charming man, lovely person, there was no question. But, you know, it, it all seemed very odd. And he made me read this Lady Ping, that awful speech. And he said, well, yes, you know. And he said, well, what have you done? And I said, well, not very much. And, you know, I said, well, actually, I'm a rat and a ferret at uh, the comedy, uh, you know, the theatre of Toad of Toad Hall. <clears throat> and he said, oh, fine, well, we'll let you know, type thing. And then... I think the booking department, because they had <clears throat> booking departments, and the booker came on and, you know, I mean, I negotiated my fee, which has taken me years to actually move up because they always refer you back to what you're... You know, I mean, God, I, I was cheap. And we, they paid me in guineas. That's how long ago it was. It was in guineas. Um, but I said to Waris afterwards, I said, you know what? He said, oh, God, he said, you know, you, you were so funny, he said, because... Uh, I'd been, you know, we were looking for this, this is a, a Chinese, a young Chinese girl, and he said, I got, everybody came up, and he said, everybody had either been Susie Wong, because Susie Wong was that era. At that time, a movie, 55 Days at Peking, had just come out. He said, everybody was either, had been in Susie Wong, had been Susie Wong, they were all in 55 Days at Peking, and he said, I remember going to see 55 Days at Peking, I didn't see any of them. You know, and he said, you marched in, and I remember because I, I'd bought this very natty coat from Phoenix, I think. Hello, Phoenix. Do I get a special offer? Um, and it was, I looked like a grenadier. It was green. Um, I, I was always quite weird. And it had black suede epaulettes, 
and silver buttons. I looked like a grenadier guard and a little sort of small busby hat. And I came from rehearsal like that. And he said, everybody else had come in, Chung Sam split up to their, you know, navels, looking, and there you came, he said, looking like a little sort of toy soldier. And, and you hadn't been in Susie Wong, you hadn't been in 55 Days at Peking, and there you were. And he said, it was so funny, but he said, yes, he said, I, I do remember that girl, because she said I was dancing with her, and she got, he said she was really poor. And he kept saying, well, if you're a BBC director, you can give me a job, give me a job. And he kept saying, well, no, actually. And he said, I got so kind of hassled by her. I finally said, well, actually, if you really want to know, I'm actually looking for a young Chinese girl. And, you know, you're not right. And she said, well, I shouldn't tell you this, but I go to school with a little person who looks oriental. And, and that is how I got the part. Everybody was very good fun. Mark was very good fun, I seem to remember. Very dishy. Gorgeous he was. And Darren Nesbitt, a super actor. Smashing actor, such presence. You know, he really, really... I mean, the, the whole thing was incredibly well cast. Such a pity it's lost. Because it was, I mean, in, incredibly, exceptionally well cast, I think. By the 7th of January, 1964, the production schedule had been revised and only one week before filming on the new story was due to begin at Ealing, it was still being planned that the story to follow A Journey to Cathay would be Malcolm Hulk's six-part The Hidden Planet. As history only knows about the real Marco Polo and his travels through the journals he dictated to Rustichello, a fellow prisoner he met whilst incarcerated in Genoa, Luca Rotti thought it would be a good idea to have the story interspersed with fictional entries in Polo's diary. To accomplish the close-ups of Polo's hand, calligraphist John Woodcock was contracted to write the journal entries, all of which were accomplished on the morning of Thursday the 16th of January at Ealing. These would then be married up with the described route being marked out on a parchment map. Success! My plan has worked! The strangers and their unusual caravan accompany me to Lop. Our route takes us across the roof of the world, down into the Kashgar Valley and southeast to Tarkan. Here we join the old Silk Road, along which the commerce and culture of a thousand years has travelled to and from Cathay. I wonder what the stranger's reaction will be when I tell them what I propose to do. Rehearsals began for the story on Monday the 27th of January at the Territorial Army Drill Hall at 239 Uxbridge Road, West 12. It was all very new to me. I had never been inside a television studio before. Uh, and Doctor Who was obviously very new because, um, you know, Bill Hartnell obviously one knew about in the sense that uh, you know he had a huge reputation, also Jackie Hill, um, uh, Bill, uh, William Russell, again you know had uh, were household names. Mark Eden was kind of heartthrob, I think, at the time. Uh, Darren Nesbitt again was always the baddie, but I mean I was totally nonplussed, I think, to begin with, because a you know for a first ever telly to get seven episodes. And also a, a jolly good part, actually. I mean, you know, it wasn't just a cough and a spit, you know. So, um, so it was overwhelming. I had a wonderful director, Waris Hussain, who was extremely kind, um, took me aside and sort of, you know, was as helpful as he could be. I mean, not some of these guys who, who actually like bullying people. Uh, he really was kind. But Bill Hartnell, I mean, he, he, he was pretty kind of irascible, I mean, offset and on. Um, but he said, Oh, darling, he's I hear this is your first television. And I said, yes, you know, terrified. I didn't know what studio days were. And um, he said, well, word of advice, um, if you dry, and I thought, I mean, I was that green, but I didn't know what it meant. He said, look, you know, because in those days, um, filming videotape was so expensive, they didn't cut unless, you know, World War Three was declared. And even then, I think they would have gone on until the end if the tape hadn't run out. Um, and we were in Lime Grove. Um, he said, he said, so there's no question of editing. I mean, we were practically live. We did it in four days. We were in studio on the fifth day, and that was it. Um, and he said, well, he said, if, um, 
If you dry, he said, they won't cut, you know. Uh, no, cut what, you know. <laughs> he said, so just swear. And he used the F word, which I won't do for, for editing purposes, but he said, just say that very loudly, and they'll have to cut. Um, he, he was a grumpy man, but he, he was very much like the character uh, he played, very much, very uh, irascible. And, uh, but if he, if he used to, the first thing he said to me when I came on, he said, now look here, old chap, if, he said, they won't go back if you go wrong. So if you go wrong, swear that they've got to go back. <laughs> of course, man never did go wrong, but he did a few times, and he would put in a swear word, and they'd have to stop and go back. Uh, but he, if he had one, you know, I remember he had one particularly bad outburst. Uh, he wasn't feeling very well, I'm sure, and he had a great shouting thing because things were going wrong, and he was, you know. And the next day, he brought flowers for all the ladies, a little bunch of flowers, and sort of said, sorry about that. And I remember Mark Eden, because I used to know my lines, and he said, I bet you're a swat. He said, I bet you. I remember he saying something like, he said, I bet you have a little crumpled envelope and you go through your lines and I bet you go through it. I said, that's right. That's what I, yeah, because, you know, I was trying, I was trying so hard. This was my first job. I was just really dedicated and the real goody two-shoes. But I remember, you know, they were all kind of winging it and sort of saying, uh -huh. but I, I, I knew everything. I mean, I knew every dot and comma. And he said, I, you're a swat, aren't you? He said. I bet you're a swat. Because yes, I am. That's how I love my lines. <laughs> so there we go. I suddenly realised what a pretty awful wig I had. It, not that it didn't cost a lot of money. It did. Again, it was made especially for me. But I, I wish now that uh, I'd insisted on, uh, on using my own hair and growing it long. And, and, and I can't now remember the reason why they didn't want me to have my own hair. I had quite a lot of hair in those days, not like now. Uh, and it was quite thick and it was dark, which was perfect for a Venetian. Uh, and I, I desperately wanted not to wear a wig because I don't like wigs and I don't like moustaches. Uh, but for some reason, and now lost in the mists of time, I can't remember why, but they made, they, they insisted on me wearing this wig. And I mean, when I see that huge, great quiff, you know, and that, that thing in the front, it's a bit like Melvin Bragg. Eric. But uh, anyway, that was it. But, and you can actually, on, a, on a, some of the things, you can actually see the, you know, the, the joint, the, um, the lace and, the, and the, the gum on it, you know. And working in a studio in those days, when the light, the heating, the lights were so intense that the heat was incredible, and they couldn't turn the, the, the air conditioning on. Uh, you know, wearing a wig and heavy, uh, and they were heavy clothes. You know, it was one of those. It was really, you know, you could feel it running down the back of your neck. The title of the second episode, "The Singing Sands," made reference to the strange noises created by the sandstorms in the Gobi Desert. But creating convincing sandstorms in the confines of Lime Grove Studio D proved to be something of a challenge. The, the worst thing was that we had to do a sandstorm in the studio which was done against black drapes uh, and cardboard rocks. This was supposed to be in the, um, some desert in Mongolia mm. when uh, they were traveling to get to the court in China. And we had these wind machines and the sandstorm, we couldn't use real sand because all the equipment would have got uh, messed up, so they put some sort of interference on the television screen to make it look like sand. Well, the result was that it looked like everyone's aerials had blown over. <laughs> um, the singing sands, well, the singing sands was just a load of sawdust. And that's what happened. Well, in it, again, in, in the studio, you know, you're clambering over old chairs and things. We get into studio and suddenly there's, they built this up and then they piled in the sawdust and then they put on the wind machines to get the sandstorm. And I'm there with Carol Ann, you know, we're taking shelter. And, um, and the wind machine starts and everything else. <clears throat> and also, as I said, we didn't, we didn't cut. I mean, you ran across the studio to get to your next shot. And so the next shot was whatever it was and we had to literally race across studio. And I remember when they said, cut to us, 
I said to Caroline, I can't see, I can't see. And my eyes were just completely covered in sword, I mean, it's just sawdust. And she said, well, ha I'll ha she said, hang on to me, hang on to me. And she literally just, you know, she took my hand, she dragged me, we ran across the studio, and she just literally threw me in front of Mark Eden, because, you know, I had to look contrite, because I'd been naughty and all that. But I didn't know where he was, and they finally did cut then, uh, and got the nurse down to wash my eyes out. The Singing Sands barely featured the character of the Doctor, although it had not originally been scripted that way. At the start of the week, William Hartnell had fallen ill and had been unable to take part in the rehearsals. As a result, last-minute rewrites to the script were necessary to remove the Doctor as much as possible. Although Hartnell was able to attend the recording on Friday the 7th of February, his appearance was limited to one brief scene at the end of the episode. Um, but, but, I mean, it was that um, ancient that um, the, the second or whatever had a buzzer. So if you did dry, they just buzzed. So they cut the sound, fed you the line, and then you carried on. And it was interesting because I can't remember in which episode, but Ping Cho, the Lady Ping Cho, which I quite like actually, Ping Cho is a silly but Lady Ping Cho, she had this long speech about the hashashins, and, which is hashish and all that. I didn't know. I mean, I was learning all the time. And, but she literally had pages of it. I mean, it was two pages. She told the story. And I remember when we got to rehearsal, you know, we'd say, oh, God, she's off again. You know, she, you know it, was like, it was like people bringing out the home movies, you know, being, oh, God, she's going to do, she's going to do that story again. They were all sending me up rotten about that. Saying, oh, yeah, every, everybody, we could all have a nap now. Ping Cho's off on her story. Um, but what happened was we were running over. And I think before we went into again um, to, to actually record, Waris came up and said, darling, we've got to cut you know, because it's, it's too long, which everybody had said anyway. Um, and, <clears throat> and I luckily, I think I went, I think her name was Penny, um, was on the book. And I actually, no one had told her. And I said, oh, Penny, oh, hang on a minute, you know, before we go, hey, just let you know, we're cutting, you know, we're going from page of there and we're cutting all that middle bit. And she said, thank God you told me, because she said, I would have thought you dried, I would have used the buzzer to prompt you. For reasons unknown, for the fourth episode, The Wall of Lies, director Waris Hussein was replaced for one week only by John Crockett, who would later go on to direct the next historical story, The Aztecs. Documentary evidence suggests that around December 1963, the original plan was to have Richard Martin direct both this fourth episode as well as the sixth, Mighty Kublai Khan. Another person to leave the production at this stage was lighting supervisor John Triese, who would be replaced for the last four episodes by Howard King. Ultimately, Triese's departure would be down to various problems he perceived with Barry Newbury's set design. And when I first showed the design to the lighting man, he refused to light it. He said, I cannot light that. There isn't a, pl there isn't a plan here, but, oh, you can just end this photograph with uh, Ping Cho, who is part, um, belongs to the group of Mongols. She's made friends with uh, Susan. Susan, um, you can just see over the top, the the top of the uh, that sloping ceiling. Mm. The studio air above the above oh, it, and this was what the lighting man was complaining about. He refused to light it. Well, he and obviously did light it in the end. No, he didn't. Someone else did. Yes. Great spirit of cooperation. Yes. Howard there. King lit it, oh. and Howard King did lots of uh, Doctor Who's. This is better because this shows you exactly the problem the lighting man had. Because if pe actors go back there, I mean, any any uh, cameraman will want his pictures, if he's lighting anyway, uh, will want the pictures backlit so that they oh. that you get this bit of light around the back there, and yeah. it brings it. It's not a halo; it's just a rim of light which brings it forward from any dark background. And with a tent like that, you can't do it. Mm. And uh, I suppose we can under understand how he, he, he objected. But another lighting man lit it, so we were all OK. On Thursday the 20th of February, the final day of rehearsals for The Wall of Lies, a five-page scene set in the Sinju Way Station was inserted into the script for inclusion in the recording the next day. <laughs> Marco, I was just coming to have a word with you. 
What about? Well, I should have thought that was pretty obvious. Be more explicit, Ian. Oh, come on, Marco. We're friends, aren't we? We were. Well, why this sudden change? And tell me, why separate Susan and Ping Cho? Susan's a bad influence. Oh, you can't really mean that. Ping Cho's first loyalty is to me. Yet she backed you against Agana. Perhaps that's because we were telling the truth. It is possible, you know. On the same day, Doctor Who gained its first Radio Times cover, showing a photograph of Marco Polo, Tigana and the Doctor to time with the broadcast of the first episode. Efforts had been made to get the Radio Times to feature a Doctor Who cover to time with the very first story. But by early November 1963, the plan had been dropped by the magazine's editor due to a lack of confidence over the program's staying power. However, when it finally did occur, this important piece of publicity for the program did not meet with the approval of William Russell, who was already unhappy over the extra last-minute dialogue that he'd been required to learn for the new way station scene. On Sunday the 23rd, Russell wrote a letter of complaint to his agent, T. Plunkett Green, irritated by the fact that two of the program's guest stars had been given preference over the rest of the regular cast for the Radio Times cover. He also complained about the last-minute script adjustments that the cast were having to deal with. The next day, Plunkett Green wrote to Donald Wilson, the head of drama serials, about his client's grievances, and later the same week Wilson sent Plunkett Green his response. I was very sorry to hear that William Russell is unhappy. I have of course discussed this at length with Verity Lambert and would like to take the matter in two distinct phases. First, the Radio Times cover. I entirely agree that Russ and the other two regulars who are not included have got grounds for complaint here. There is no doubt at all that they have all worked beautifully together as a team. A great deal of the success of the serial is due to this, and I myself was very unhappy when I saw the Radio Times cover. At the photo call there were many pictures taken, which included all four of the running characters, and we had confidently expected that one of these would be used. Unfortunately for us, the Radio Times makes its own decisions, and all we can do is protest after the event. This I am doing. This is nothing to do, however, with the other matter, which is entirely a question of scripts. I know that Verity Lambert has discussed all this very thoroughly in the last two days with all four principals, and I believe that now they are feeling much happier about what she's been able to tell them of our future plans. As you will now know, it is agreed that we should continue Doctor Who for at least 52 weeks. This gives us a chance to work much further ahead in scripts and make sure that we do not again have to plunge into an unprepared job. I assure you that I will myself be watching very carefully to make sure that neither William Russell's or our own interests suffer from scripts which do not use his talents to the maximum. It upset him very much that he wasn't on, and he should have been, I think. But, you know, <sighs> the decision's not left to us. It's the people that uh, make those decisions sometimes get it wrong. And yes, he was. He was very, very, very upset, I remember. Yeah, and I don't blame him because, you know, he was one of the stalwarts of it. Um, and, you know, it was quite a coup to get the front of the Radio Times for any actor to be on the front of Radio Times. Um, uh, but, yeah, he was left out and he was, he was very miffed about that. Following his work on The Wall of Lies, Crockett subsequently submitted a memo to David Whittaker suggesting some possible historical periods for the programme to exploit. Among his list were a number of ideas that would eventually make their way into future stories, such as the Viking raids on Britain, which would be incorporated into the Time Meddler, Bonnie Prince Charlie in the Highlanders, the Crusades and Richard I in the Crusade, and 18th to early 19th century Cornish smugglers and wreckers in the Smugglers. Crockett's idea of basing a story around the Romans in Britain was one that David Whittaker had already explored. As far back as September 1963, a six-part serial to be written by Malcolm Hulk had been contemplated featuring the TARDIS's arrival in the Britain of 400 AD, as the Romans are planning to retire from the island. What I remember mostly was the makeup 
because, because we were Mongols. We had a gauze bits here which had ties so that it was then tied at the back of your head so that your eyes were like that. And one was like that for the whole day. And I remember sitting on, on the fire escape at Lime Grove, um, starving and in great pain because it, obviously you couldn't actually do very much uh, with, with this particular makeup. Um, and the other thing, the photographs I've just seen make the show look quite lavish. But of course, I was living in a cave, supposedly. And it was only about this big. And I, would, I came out of a hole. And my set was just a few bits of grass and a mound of sand. And of course, so you couldn't shoot off. I mean, they had to be very tight um, on, on the shop. And I came out with my eyes all squinty and had to crouch behind these few blades of grass while Darren Nesbitt shouted at me. Well, I always thought it was rather strange because I had all this makeup and I sounded exactly like Noel Coward I thought when I came out so I, I hadn't seen another human being for years so how I was able to speak like that I don't know but I did and hid behind my blade of glass but it was, every set was tiny you would just turn a flat and there would be a palace but only two flats of it. For the sixth episode Mighty Kublai Khan Tutti Lemko's character Kaiju was scripted to be seen with a small monkey that would sit on his shoulder during the scene set in the Chen Ting way station. However, the monkey proved not to be entirely cooperative. Not so nice was the nasty little monkey that they had in it. Uh, I'm an animal lover. I adore animals. All animals. They say don't work with animals and children, and this is a case that proves the point. It was a nasty little thing. It was... It was peeing all over the place, and uh, it bit anybody who came anywhere near it, and it was not pleasant. It was always holding up the filming because at a particular point in the dialogue it was jumping somewhere it shouldn't have been jumping, or chattering somewhere it shouldn't have been chattering. I didn't know monkeys could chatter as much as this thing did the whole time. There you go. <laughs> We had this little spider monkey sitting on top of someone's shoulder. He was supposed to belong to one of the bandits. And the moment the mach wind machine started and this special effects sound started, the poor little thing got so panicked that it, uh, it had a bowel movement <laughs> all over everybody, including the man's shoulder, and it stank for the rest of the... I mean, it, I cannot ex it probably is the best use against uh, enemies uh, hiding in jungles that you ever want to just get a spider monkey because it's much worse than anything you could use with gas or anything else. Anyway, that was probably the worst thing that happens with special effects affecting an actual live animal, oh which affected God. the rest of us. <laughs> I just remember the monkey, because it got lost. It, it, it went up into, you know, the things. It just, it just, he went, he went, and we couldn't find him. I mean, you know, he was just swinging around, and, uh, you, know, I, you know, I mean, I, obviously that was on the recording between 7 and 10. <clears throat> and he just went for about an hour or so, and we were trying to coax him down and everything else, but we all still had to record, there was no question of waiting. Earlier in the day, studio rehearsals commenced with the episode's opening scene as Tagana holds Susan captive to prevent the travellers leaving. As part of the action, actor Darren Nesbitt was required to lunge with a knife. However, Nesbitt accidentally caught Mark Eden with a glancing blow to his right hand, and the resulting laceration required treatment from one of the corporation's medical staff. But I, I have terrible cracky knees, um, which again ten, tend to be actually, you know, they're quite all right. Then you get into the studio and I have to kneel down, they crack. I mean, they literally, I mean, one of the cast said I had castanet knees, I think. Um, and I think it was, we were going through the undergrowth and I think Tutti Lemko was the, ba was the bandit and he was sort of by the fire. Um, and I think Bill Russell and I were coming, creeping forward, and a twig snaps, and he looks up. You know, fine, that's the cue. But <laughs> Merton getting getting ready to crawl through the undergrowth, the twig goes snap. Merton's knees goes crack, 
And, you know, poor Tutti has to completely ignore that uh, and then wait until there's some sort of minor little snap and he goes, ooh. But, you know, but it was the only way. I mean, we had to get down and, you know, as I said, there was no cutting or anything. And I think the other thing I had to do, I think when they I had to kneel in front of the, the carn or something, again, my knees went, you know, it's just, you know, it's like real castanet knees. The seventh and final episode, Assassin at Peking, went into studio on Friday the 13th of March 1964. But the day did not get off to a good start when a lift required to transport a camera dolly up to Studio D broke down and had to be repaired. A further delay of 15 minutes also ensued when a studio fireman refused to let camera rehearsals get underway due to various pieces of equipment blocking the fire passageways. As a result of the delay, Donald Wilson asked Mervyn Pinfield to provide him with a report on the hold-ups. On March 24th, Wilson wrote a memo to Verity Lambert outlining his conclusions. It seems to be generally understood that for years the problem of equipment storage on the stage has led to difficulty in beginning lighting on any show with a one-day stand. This has usually been overcome by a tactful PA and a realistic fireman getting together. On this occasion it seems that the old boy network sprang a leak and the always possible situation arose when everybody decided to stick to the strict letter of the rules. There is only one way to avoid troubles of this kind and that is to make sure that directors and designers use only the amount of space in Studio D which can be filled with sets without overflowing onto the necessary storage space. It could be said that this adds to the already difficult problem of making Doctor Who in Studio D but my opinion is that this problem will only be exaggerated if the directors and designers demand more of the studio than it is capable of supplying. The mere idea of being in that place, it wasn't there, no, it wasn't perfect. In fact, it was pretty awful. Uh, it was very, very primitive, and the dressing rooms were bad, and the canteen was pretty dire. But uh, I quite enjoyed it. I quite enjoyed it. It was there at uh, Lime Grove that I, I was curious. I was a great football fan, uh, especially when I was a kid, and I was a great Spurs supporter. And I was standing in the queue to get my food, and I looked up, and I was standing next to Danny Blancheflower. Now, Danny Blancheflower was captain of Spurs and captain of Northern Ireland, and he was my idol. And I was playing the lead in this, you know. And I think I was done up all in my gear, I'm not sure. And, you know, I wanted to say to him, oh, you know, can I shake you by the hand or whatever? Because this man was, you know, when you suddenly see somebody that you've admired so much, and I couldn't, and I couldn't say anything. And then, uh, he just got his stuff and walked away. And I thought, why? Why didn't I just say to him, you know, hello, you know, I've watched you so many times and thanks. But I didn't. But that was at Lime Grove. I don't know what he was doing there. But, uh, but I mean, I know I, I kind of shocked them all because what we did, you know, you went into studio on, on, on studio day and then you had a recording break between six and seven. Um, you did as much as you could as a technical run, um, having rehearsed for four days. Uh, you had a studio break and then you went and recorded between seven and ten. And I, it was only the, only happened once, I have to say. But I was so naive, so green. I, oh, goody, supper break. And I, you know, I mean, I know I look little, but I eat a lot. And I thought, oh, goody. So I went off, you know, and I thought, oh, terrific. So, and I remember them all of the cast looking at me. They couldn't believe, because I went out with my, everybody else was having a little bit of toast and tea or something, light meal. And Merton, you know, had sort of like, you know, steak and kidney pudding and chips and peas and beans and this. And I think I had something called spotted dick and, and, and custard. And they couldn't believe that, you know, before going in for, for a studio, I was shoving all this stuff into my mouth. Okay, no one else eating. Oh, I've got to eat. You know, it's time to wait to eat. I have to say that, I mean, I was very leaden at the end of it. And I, I never actually ate that much again. But I, I think they were absolutely stymied. That shows how naive and green I was. Because I thought, oh, goody, supper break, I'm going to eat. And they went, ah, oh, what is she doing? <laughs> but we were using 
I think I remember, curved swords. Now I'd done actually quite a few sword fights with with straight, you know, with rapiers and 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 straight swords, but curved ones are a little bit more difficult. So that was difficult, but we uh, we did manage it. And I think it looked, as I remember, I think it looked fairly good. Uh, so Stellan was quite good. <coughs> we were both quite good at. Um, at doing things like that because we'd done quite a lot of that sort of thing, you know, playing because we were both of an age, you know, young and kind of, and I used to do quite a lot of my own stunts. Uh, I packed that up after I broke my ankle, but uh, I used to, if they weren't that dangerous, I would, I would do them. I mean, it was so much better than getting a, a stunt double to do it for you. But uh, as I say, eventually I broke my ankle and, and lost the film because of it. So I didn't do them anymore. Following transmission of the story, the production office received a number of letters of complaint from schools concerned about the fact that the Doctor and his companions were meeting up and interacting with real historical figures and that this might impact upon children's comprehension of genuine historical events. For a while, the production office took the observation seriously, and as a result, a six-part script by Morris Fahey, entitled Farewell Great Macedon, dealing with the Doctor's encounter with Alexander the Great in Babylon, was shelved. Whilst the story may not have met the absolute approval of certain teachers, it was still as enthusiastically received by the younger audience as any of the previous adventures. We used to get letters, even then, and... Not a great deal, but we used to get them quite a lot from, from kids. And I got one, there was one episode where the, the last bit of the episode, Tigana, the villain, was pouring poison down the well that we were about to come to. Or what, anyways, I can't remember now. And ha ha ha, you know, Marco Polo, I'll make sure, I can't remember what exactly with them. And I got a letter in... in in little childish handwriting saying, Dear Marco Polo, don't drink the water in the well, Tigan has poisoned it. <laughs> oh, it was wonderful. The story sold extremely well overseas, with 16mm film prints of all seven episodes being distributed all over the world. On the 20th of February 1969, BBC Enterprises sent a memo to John Henderson, the assistant head of copyright, requesting that as the rights to sell Marco Polo overseas were due to lapse on the 3rd of April that year, a further extension of sales rights for another five years should be obtained from John Lucarotti. As a result of this, Henderson wrote to Lucarotti's agent, Harvey Anna, to secure new rights up until April 1974. But it's interesting to note that here, as well as in previous documentation authorising payment to Lucarotti for overseas sales, the story is always referred to by its former title, Doctor Who and a Journey to Cathay. Despite its worldwide distribution, however, no copies of any of the seven episodes are currently known to exist. A brief glimmer of hope surfaced in 1991 when fan Graham Howard was allowed access to Television New Zealand in order to check through the large stocks of overseas programmes that TVNZ had been accumulating. Howard came across a film can bearing the label Doctor Who Assassin at Peking, but sadly the film print inside was not one of the missing Doctor Who episodes. Two years later, three of the principal guest actors from Marco Polo, Mark Eden, Darren Nesbitt and Martin Miller, all found themselves in yet another fantasy setting when they starred in the 11th Prisoner episode, It's Your Funeral. Uh, you know what I have in mind. It's all right now. Intriguing. What's it for? It's nothing. It's just a tie. Good. Very good. Thank you. Well? Was it all right? Perfectly, friend. Exactly. It wasn't very difficult, but I still don't understand why is it necessary to expose our method. It'll all be explained to you in time. No, now, what can we gain by letting him know what we are up to, the enemy? We add to their confusion. That's what we stand to gain. 
the thing I remember mainly about it was the fun we had. Because quite often you don't have fun doing things because there's a lot of pressure with time and everything. But you know, all that dressing out, and, and Bill Russell is a, is a terrible giggler and, and practical joker. Bill Partner wasn't, I have to say. Uh, <clears throat> but we had a lot of young people in it and, you know, lots of chums were in it. And uh, Wallace was, a, was great fun. Uh, so it was a very, very happy production. That's the main thing I remember about it. Warris was an absolute sweetie. We used to go back to his flat and we used to make music out of saucepans. We had a lovely time with him. It was great fun. Warris would invite, you know, a load of the cast back to his house, his mother's house actually, in Fulham uh, for dinner. And, you know, Dougie Canfield invited us around to his house in Holland Park for drinks. And, you know, it was a really kind of nice... Really nice atmosphere. Great. They should all be like that. <laughs>